say we have worked on how the antigen presentation is down regulated in the animal system and how to deliver the uh, drugs to the salmonella because salmonella is in a vacuole and how do you in fact break the biofilm with the help of the shock waves and how the metabolism uh, of salmonella and the uh, is linked to the pathogenesis and the virulence the role of the porins and the omtins etc carbon starvation gene a uh, lot of my young colleagues have worked on it and working on it how do it breach the blood brain barrier and then finally that how does it infect plant now the plant salmonella infection is very novel and uh, we will discuss a uh, lot of these interactions uh, in the slide come uh, salmonella is a very very strict pathogen extremely strict pathogen so before we get into the plant system let me give you a brief introduction about the animal system so that you can you know very beautifully visualize the different ways by which the same bug which infects plant using sorry animal using one system behaves very differently in the plant system and maybe very much unexplored area of the salmonella lifestyle or the salmonella virulence factor in plant is remaining to be done and Uh, there are many young colleagues in the as a listener now at this and uh, the present forum and i would indeed love to have their views and thoughts uh, once we finish the discussion uh, you are also very much uh, you know encouraged to uh, ask questions in between but if you cannot please write it down and we will have a wonderful discussion session so let us begin with how does it actually in fact the uh, human Salmonella's route of entry is through fecal oral. That means that when there is a contaminated food and water, and we ingest that, salmonella gets inside through the contaminated food and water, right into the food pipe, passes the acidic pH of the stomach, and it has a wonderful two-component system to resist this acidic stress, and it lands up in small intestine. Now, in the small intestine. which is made up of the intestinal enterocytes and the lining of these so called enterocytes there are these very beautiful cells the ontogeny is not very well known they are known as the m cells now the m cells constitute just 0.01% of the entire enterocyte lining and we still do not know that what are the cues for the m cells to be developed are the m cells differentiated from these enterocytes upon the bacterial queue or they are already there there is a lot of uh, research which is still going on though it is a 3 to 4 year decade research but the mystery of the m cell is unresolved but what these m cells do is that they take up they take up the pathogen from the surface and they sample the pathogen and there is a process of transcytosis that means from the uh, the site of the uh, ex exposed environment that is from the uh, lumin uh, luminal site it is going all the way down into the intestine now this intestine lamina propria layer is the layer where you have lot of these immune cells like t cells b cells macrophages dendritic cells and this process of entry from the m cells <laughs> external environment all the way down of the internal hello any question okay no fine uh, so the all the way it down into the internal environment and is captured by the macrophages and the dendritic cells should have actually killed the pathogen but they don't because salmonella is very clever they stay within this pathogen in a vacuole this is known as a salmonella containing vacuole a very famous niche well studied niche in the animal system uh, and we will know that how uh, we are still trying to understand that whether the same kind of niche exists in the plant but we do not know yet uh, i don't think so you may uh, we will discuss this further so within the vacuole and vacuole is the most important niche of the salmonella uh, they beautifully evade all the strategies and then they spread from here see for example if you see this this is nothing but the green bacteria and which is covered with your uh, salmonella containing vacuole hello okay i think there is some background noise fine no issues so now this is how it is happening in the animal system so i think this is very clear in your mind 
that we ingest it through contaminated food and water. So indeed, if your tomato and our cucumber or our cabbage is contaminated, we are going to land up in the similar way and our bacteria will be sampled. If it is a non-typhoidal serovar, then they will be killed here. But if it is a typhoidal serovar, we have a big issue. It will become disseminated and the disseminated cause typhoid fever. So uh, now, let us understand that what is the source of salmonella infection? Uh, salmonella infection source can be many. It can come from the dairy products. The dairy products are a very predominant source of the salmonella infection. It can come from the processed uh, plant products, which are processed in the, in the plants. And chocolate processing is one of the nightmare for uh, Cadbury Industries. When Cadbury was completely once upon a time shut down for for a couple of months because their entire chocolate production was contaminated with salmonella and poultry. Definitely poultry is one of the major important source of the contamination and the poultry, the birds, they are contaminated, they are infected with uh, salmonella gallinarum and salmonella pulorum, the two most important causative agent of foul typhoid. It is known as a foul typhoid. It is very deadly because these fowl or the poultry, the birds, they just die and uh, there is actually no looking back. So a lot of uh, research on the vaccine development of uh, Salmonella pulorum and Salmonella gall uh, gallinarum too. But what is the major threat of Salmonella is all these food industries that they face. And that is the reason that Salmonella is in the top of the list for the agriculture and the food sector. And there has to be a way to be uh, make sure that the product is contamination, salmonella free. If that is there, then it passes all the regulatory acts. So it is indeed one of the most important pathogen. Now, if you indeed look into the number of outbreaks, which is linked to the fresh produce in the United States in this particular time period, 1990 to 2004, you will see that among all these pathogens, say Salmonella enterica, pathogenic E. coli, Shigella species or Campylobacter species, it is the Salmonella enterica, which is highlighted here, is constituting the major outbreak in all the classi uh, classified fruits, leafy vegetables, seed sprouts, totaling to 49, making it again one of the most important pathogen of, uh, of uh, and hazardous pathogen with respect to the food and with respect to agriculture. Now, you know what? It is very interesting to see that these kind of reports, which are so good uh, in United States because they do have a MMWR, which is known as a mortality morbidity weekly reports. So MMWR, if you really uh, screen through, and I would request all my young colleagues back in uh, Ubik, um, Uttar Bongo Krishi Vishwa Vidyale, uh, to get inside these journals, uh, uh, Morbidity Mortality Weekly Reports, because it is going to give you a lot of idea and a lot of in-depth knowledge about the outbreaks which are related to the plant and related to the animal husbandry with respect to uh, bacteria or virus or whatever the cause may be. Uh, and you are going to get an in-depth reason for why we should be studying a particular organism, because there has to be a reason behind every a question that you ask for. And this is the biggest reason. If you see here, it is indeed the reason for us to understand the plant salmonella interaction. Uh, in India, unfortunately, we do not have at all a surveillance mechanism. And uh, we even do not care. It's just that when our research started kicking in with the help of all the news reporters, everything became now visible and the farmers are showing a lot of interest in understanding how they get rid of this uh, salmonella infection and in their own produce. But how does it entry into the food chain? How does it make an entry into the food chain? Salmonella is there everywhere. Now, let me tell you a small story. Salmonella and E. coli diverged some 10.3 million years ago. Salmonella and E. coli, they were so close siblings, kind of a sibling, where E. coli became a kind of a commensal, not all strains. You have a four strains, enteropathogenic E. coli, aggregative E. coli, enteroadhesive E. coli, and enterohemorrhagic E. coli. These four strains are extremely dangerous. But you have an E. coli, which is quite humble and which is there in our gut. But Salmonella just took a deviation and it became a strict pathogen. 
And that is the only reason it is so difficult for us to get any kind of permission to work with salmonella in the field. And I actually is, I'm looking forward for your help. Uh, help from GKVK, help from uh, uh, your Uttar Bongo Krishi Vishwavidyala and help from a couple of uh, agriculture universities to help us in actually doing some of the field experiments. Uh, because it is a very strict pathogen and we simply cannot just work it without any um, uh, appropriate uh, safety uh, committee approvals. Now, post-harvest contaminations in the food industries or contaminated water and asymptomatic carriers, they are quite well known. So these are all the post-harvest contamination entry into the food chain. The famous uh, uh, way by which the post-harvest contamin or the post-contamination happen is a great example of a typhoid Mary or Mary Mallon who was isolated in the Long Island because she was a healthy carrier. Uh, there is a wonderful story of Mary Mallon and how she was isolated and how she was, you know, taken up by the authorities. And when they figured out that she did not show symptoms at all, but she had spread this typhoid fever through her cooking in many, many families, including royal families. And the germs were just hidden behind her nails. So hand wash, advocating hand wash is very important. Uh, and that is how Salmonella had spread through her cooking. Uh, she was isolated, then she changed her name, she became a washerwoman, but cooking was her passion. So she did not leave cooking, she came back, she again infected many individuals. So this is how the uh, Salmonella had spread in the post-harvest way, you know, the nothing to do with uh, through food, but it is coming from somewhere else. Either the water is contaminated, because it comes from the sewage, sewage is not treated and it gets in, inside the field or a person himself or herself is contaminated who is cooking the food for you. Now, this is quite well known and we know about the post-harvest contamination. Now, the pre-harvest contamination, that means from where is it actually coming? Contaminated irrigation water is one of the major source, though we do not have a very direct evidence to figure out at, at, at least in India, and have a way or a detection system to figure out that whether my water is contaminated, what water I'm using for irrigation, is it contaminated with salmonella? Do I have a very good sensor to figure out whether my irrigation water contains salmonella? So, but it is a big source of, uh, irrigation water is a big source of contamination. Insect vectors, it looks like that certain insects they kind of uh, carry the salmonella, they brush it along with them. And when they uh, graze or when they come in contact with the plant, they leave the salmonella because salmonella is an amazing opportunistic uh, creature which can take uh, help of anything, any opening and it gets inside. And also these many of these uh, animal based manure which can contain salmonella. Salmonella Dublin, which infects cows. And if the manure, uh, cow manure or the cow dung is used as a manure without uh, knowing that what is the burden of the salmonella that can also contribute. So many of these uh, pre-harvest contamination can come from these uh, insects or the water or animal um, based manure. And uh, mm -hmm. as I told, to, told you that there is absolutely no way to understand whether we our system is contaminated because nobody is paying interest uh, into developing a sensor or developing a very strict strategy, control strategy or the control measures to understand the presence of salmonella. Now, salmonella is a BSL-2 pathogen. What is BSL-2? It is a biosafety lab 2. So you have a BSL-1, BSL-2 and the BSL-3. BSL-3 means that you cannot work without certain very strict procedures and uh, negative air pressure. BSL-3 is a very different lab. Now, salmonella contains 2,700 serovars, more than 2,700 serovars and the serovars are going on, uh, you know, uh, getting into the chain one after the other. As and when they discovered, they add it up. If you grow salmonella typhi, now there are only two specific serovar which infects human, which causes systemic typhoid fever, is salmonella typhi and salmonella paratyphi. Now, all the salmonella serovars are BSL-2 pathogen if they are grown in a limited quantity. Salmonella typhi becomes a BSL-3 pathogen 
if somebody wants to grow it in more than you know 10 to 20 liters so that becomes a bsl3 pathogen otherwise salmonella remains a bsl2 pathogen and that is the only reason that why working with salmonella is a very big uh, kind of uh, uh, not a threat i would say but a huge amount of cautionary precautions needs to be taken uh, so the lab uh, developed so when kapudeep joined the lab we were working and having all the precautionary measures in place about our animal system. But when he joined and when we started to work with, wanted to work with the plant system, he had to develop everything from the scratch, uh, develop the standard operating procedures, which was then taken all the way through, developed in 2014, developed to taken all the way through 2017 to get its approval when we wanted to work really in the greenhouse, the pot experiment. So you can imagine the time scale that it takes to develop a very authentic and very foolproof system to work with uh, salmonella. And for that matter, any of the pathogens which belong to the category of strict pathogens. Because the lab safety is the most important part here. The risk is involved because it's a foodborne human pathogen. So the bigger risk is involved here and the resources that you need to get, the BSL2 cabinet, all the gloves, the lab coat, the clothes to shoes. So all these resources needs to be in the place and the very strict protocol for disposal. It is just not something that we should be, uh, you know, uh, doing it for that matter, even with E. coli that culture the bacteria and throw it in the sink. That is just, just not acceptable. And it is a big threat to our system. So how to do the bleaching uh, treatment, how to autoclave them. So very strict disposal method in the place. You are all agriculture scientists, budding scientists. So you know all the, all the more that how difficult it will be now when you work with soil, right? So the greenhouse safety is the most important critical measure here when you are working with plants. Uh, you need to make sure that you have all the resources, clean water supply resources, all the resources of your greenhouse in place, like insect proof nets, your gloves, your lab coats, your mesh, and then most importantly, the disposal. If you compare the disposal of the agar versus the soil, it is a big lot of big difference. Our agar plates, we simply take them, put it in the autoclave bag. Animal waste, we incinerate them. Now, huge amount of soil, how do you dispose? So this is again, a very important way of autoclaving, three rounds of the autoclave, and then uh, uh, going across uh, the autoclaving and disposing them. So imagine putting all of them in the place in a very strict way with a vigilance officer, and then starting the work. After all these, we still do not have a piece of a, <laughs> whatever a land, where we can in fact do our experiments. And, and very uh, soon uh, our uh, group with Professor Utpalnath and uh, Professor Natraj, et cetera, we are trying to get this approval done and the greenhouse, uh, additional greenhouse has been approved uh, in our own department. And I am really hoping uh, and looking forward to expand this entire process. So why did I spend a bit of time here for all of you to understand that this is a time taking process so kindly Pay attention if you are really indeed going to make up the uh, lab in your own facility. Now, uh, understanding now the pattern of colonization. What happened when I myself started my work, uh, uh, I was a Humboldt fellow with uh, Professor Michael Hensel. So during that time, the salmonella secretion system type one, uh, the SPI one encoded by pathogenicity island one was very uh, well known. It was it's very beautiful it just looks like a needle and everybody worked on it but there is a second secretion system which is encoded by pathogenicity island 2 and nobody uh, was ever interested but this pathogenicity island the most pathogenicity island which is encoded by pathogenicity island 2 so i started working on it and i figured out that this is indeed this pathogenicity island the needle is not pretty you know it is kind of a disorganized needle but you see here that how beautifully the effector proteins, this beaded structure, what you see are the effector proteins which are getting all the way from the bacterial cytosol onto the host system. Now this is the in vitro system, but we have also evidence for the in vivo. That means within the cell. Now, animal cell and plant cell, again, a very big difference in the cell architecture. 
animals uh, cell does not have a cell wall but your plant cell have a cell wall and it is not only having a cell wall but it is very sturdy very very sturdy you simply cannot maybe use these uh, secretion system needle even to poke your thick cellulose layer uh, so what many of the phytopathogens do is they are going to make this secretion system needle you know encoded by type 3 you can take help of example of uh, pseudomonas syringiae or irvinia chrysanthemi uh, and then they will make this kind of the needle they will indeed secrete their effector proteins and then their effector proteins are just going to get inside and hopefully will uh, use uh, these effector proteins to now go and colonize the and start infecting the plant uh before that they have to have a way to degrade your pectin and degrade your cellulose so they do have pectinases and cellulases so lot of these proteins to prepare them uh, enzymes to prepare them to have their hold on the system and then finally create the infection and when it creates the infection so for example if you take a example of a very strict pathogen so the entire idea for me to present this work here is how we are distinguishing between something which is indeed a phytopathogen like pseudomonas syringiae or irvinia chrysanthemi versus something which is not a phytopathogen which is a salmonella so this is what the difference is and you will see the difference as and when it goes all the more the difference will become clear because of its very beautiful nature of using the opportunity you know so like syringiae is a strict phytopathogen so you will see this very sequential entry into the layers whereas when you talk about salmonella there is no such sequential entry it is just a random localization uh, into the tissue so uh, uh, the uh, random localization actually tells us that it is indeed not a phytopathogen per se because it is it may not be using these kind of very strict secretion system needles to have its entry but something else uh, so kapudi passed a question what is this something else what is this mode of entry if it is not using this very strict needle system what is this mode of entry and he had put lot of these experiment to figure out what you see here is this wonderful root this is the entire root this is called as a tiling of this is the tiles you know each tile and when you do this tiling microscopy you see and reconstruct that entire root here and just look at these tiles you know various tiles and uh, be aware that what you are seeing here uh this kind of attachment of the bacteria to a very specific parts uh and not everywhere simply random attachment but somehow making it uh some kind of a notion that they are taking advantage of something and that advantage of something is nothing but a big discovery of entering through the lateral root openings now when the root the main root started getting its lateral root there is some a process a very important process known as a epithelial remodeling or the remodeling of the cells now this cells not the epithelial remodeling but the remodeling of the cells a uh, plant tissue now similar to the epithelial remodeling what you see in the animal system this particular plant system upon the emergence of the lateral root they have something known as a you know very natural opening because your root is emerging you see here the emerging of this lateral root so it is emerging so whenever something is emerging there will be a space now very quickly salmonella takes uh, uh, advantage of this space and it starts colonizing here and the moment it gets attracted to this space and it starts colonizing here start here is the initiation factor for them to become invasive in a term we use the word invasive in animal system but here we will use the term entry so this particular opening is the most important hallmark of the entry of salmonella and this uh, lateral root emergence and the lateral root point of entry became a major discovery in our lab to in fact understand that indeed uh, we should not be taking this very lightly as it is just not a problem of uh, 
you know, post harvest contamination. There is indeed a niche in the soil which infects through the lateral root opening. Uh, and what all plants you can test? Now, tomato is one of the most important plant because there are a lot of reports in the mortality morbidity weekly report about tomatoes. You know, tomato farms being contaminated, entire California tomato farms are closed, the entire plant product, tomato ketchup, huge million dollar loss in the industry. So tomato is indeed one of the major crop which gets infected. And also remember one important point, tomato is a salad vegetables, you eat it raw. Salmonella is very sensitive to heat. You can kill it by heating. But all these vegetables that my colleagues tested, uh, Kapudeep and now followed by Kirti, is a tomato, cucumber, cabbage. All of them are salad vegetables. Of course, cabbage in India we cook, but in Western countries, they eat it as again as a raw vegetable. Cucumber is all the way the raw vegetable. At least tomato, we cook it sometime. But all the three are salad vegetables. So you can understand the threat which uh, we can have by consuming these vegetables raw. And all of these vegetables, tomato, cucumber, and uh, cabbage, if you follow this route of entry, you will see that each one of them are beautifully entering through this lateral route entry. So the lateral route is the most important, uh, opening is the most important site of infection. And more and more vegetables will be screened now very soon. And we will try to understand that, uh, in fact, uh, what is the level of the threat in all the different salad plants that is eaten raw. Uh, now the news became indeed very viral and it became so viral that we started getting a call from the DBT, from the DST, from uh, most importantly from uh, DAE, Department of Atomic Energy, because they have a very huge uh, you know, consortium on food safety. Uh, and then they wanted to know that indeed what we can do. Uh, one of the very important, of, uh, apart from Hindu and many other you know, times of India, one very important uh, uh, news, which is very close to my heart because it really helped the farmers are the Rajasthan Patrika because Rajasthan Patrika is in Hindi and this particular Rajasthan Patrika was, uh, was spread across in the belt of Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh. And indeed, the, uh, the, all these uh, farmers, they have read it. And you will not believe the news reporter who is still in touch with me, who, who always wants to know what is happening in the field because he told me one thing that, you know, your all discoveries are making a very big uh, difference in the way our farmers are looking at planting the crops. And that is the reason we would like to thank you. So this particular Rajasthan Patrika is extremely close to my heart because it has helped the farmers in a very, very big way. Uh, and then of course, now we know that it is a food hazard and salad vegetables are a food hazard. So how do we uh, you know, take care of it? How do we indeed uh, figure out that what is to be done? So let us look into some of the uh, uh, in situ progression of infection. Uh, now, uh, I am always going to, uh, you know, tell you that this is a small twitch that has happened right from the animal biology to the plant biology. And as I mentioned to you, everything is a serendipity. I'm extremely lucky with my group and with my young colleagues who joined the labs at the right time. Same is with Kapudeep that has happened. He joined the lab at the right time where our entire focus and attention of plant and animal became almost 50-50 because plant is always very cute. You can see them. So first time he was start growing plants in the agar plate and the entire lab was so fascinated by seeing the seedlings mature. And then these small Arabidopsis growing and all of these students who were in the plant bio animal field, they all showed so much of interest and all these lab meetings were amazing because the new model has come. It's like a new baby, you know, when the new baby comes the way you, uh, you know, you, you take care. It was just like a new baby entering into our lab and all of us were highly, highly uh, excited and interested. And then his all experiments, each one of us, you know, not only him, each one of us were always waiting for the new data. Then he designed an experiment, started designing the experiment first from the, in the agar plate and then finally into the, into the soil by the time. So it took that long, in fact, to get all the procedures in place. 
and then he had uh, got into the uh, the soil experiments and uh, then figured out by using also one of the very important phytopathogen Ralstonia, Ralstonia solanaceae, then uh, compared it with Salmonella typhipurium and E. coli, and he put up an experiment where uh, you will use this uh, particular terminology SRPT that is uh, none other than the soil, then it is a, uh, the rhizoplane, then it is a rhizosphere, and then it is a tissue. So T stands for tissue, and the S stands for the rhizosphere, and the P stands for the rhizoplane. And of course, S is the soil. So you see this division, and uh, my, my colleagues now uh, in uh, Agriculture University, you will be able to understand much better and appreciate this very, very well, these nomenclatures. And you will see here, when you calculate the log CFU, log CFU is nothing but it is a CFU plating. That means you calculate the colony forming unit, you know, in the soil, and uh, then you uh, put it as a log CFU. So it's a very simple experiment, though it may look complicated, but it's an extremely simple experiment. So you normalize it to the weight of the soil. And then when you see here, the Ralstonia, which is indeed a very important uh, phytopathogen, and the CFU, if you compare, the CFU is always very quite high in everywhere. But when you see the tissue, and here is where the difference came. And of course, the difference started coming from the rhizosphere uh, and the rhizoplane itself, that this Salmonella typhimurium, though it did not show as high as in the uh, non-rhizosphere or in the rhizosphere uh, plane in this particular area, but it was always much kind of uh, significant difference was found between the strong phytopathogen and an opportunistic uh, pathogen. Uh, there was no difference between the E. coli and Salmonella in these two non-rhizosphere and rhizosphere. The difference started appearing dramatically in the tissue and in the rhizosplane. Now, this dramatic difference between the E. coli and Salmonella made us to think that indeed salmonella is an opportunistic pathogen. So it does not only enter through these lateral entry, but now we can take it much further to understand that it is just not a chance uh, pathogen. It is indeed an opportunistic pathogen and it is behaving very different from that of the E. coli. So this dramatic, uh, you know, the probability between the salmonella typhimurium in the E. coli, if you look at these two, uh, particular uh, bars will uh, make you to think much further that now how do you go ahead in understanding the progression of infection. So uh, I think it is very clear to you. So this is the soil region. So this is this root and then you have a rhizosphere and the rhizoplane. Uh, uh, so the enrichment and the migration. So these are the two uh, the very important uh, further experiments which will be uh, which you will be uh, learning now. Now, what do you mean by enrichment and what do you mean by migration? The migration is, enrichment is the enrichment needs to be in the soil. So suppose if you have a certain number which is present in the soil, there has to be a way by which actually the soil burden itself is increasing. And the migration will be that there has to be something which is coming from your life plan because it is migrating from certain region to certain region. And migration is always in response to certain chemotactic agent or certain parameters or certain factors, which will be very lucrative for the bacteria to get attracted to. So migration is always an attraction. So the attraction versus the enrichment. So it has to grow and it has to migrate to the site. How do you in fact do this experiment? Kabudeep has figured out a very smart experiment here by putting certain filters. Now six micron filter is quite big for the bacteria to migrate uh, and also the root exudates to uh, get across. Uh, but if you put a 0.2 micron filter, the 0.2 micron filter will not allow your bacteria to go anywhere from the outer circle to the inner circle because the bacterial size is roughly around 1.2 micron to 0.8 uh, micron. So it will not allow. But the root exudate small molecules, no problem. They will get inside. But when you have no membrane, that means you uh, replace any of this membrane with a cellophane 
paper or any other paper, then nothing can grow. Okay, so this is the entire nice experiment where you separate out your region and demarcate it very, very beautiful demarcation. And then you ask, start asking a question that your soil is having your salmonella now. If it is getting enriched, then if you have the root exudate, will it now start migrating, right? So it's a very beautiful, clean experiment which had answered many of the very important questions. And uh, what are the strains that are used? It is a wild type Salmonella strain, Salmonella typhimurium, and then you use certain knockout. Now this knockout, fly C, don't get perturbed by all the terminologies. If you are more interested, I am very, very happy to take few classes for you or just have a nice interactive sessions to make you understand about the entire genetics of salmonella. Now, flysi is a gene which codes for flagellin protein, okay? And FLJB is one of the so-called master regulators in that entire flagellin uh, secretion operon. Now, flagella is also secreted by a kind of type 3 secretion system, which is a flagellar secretion system. So if you have a mutation, so we make mutant in the salmonella also quite easy to make. So these two strains were used to understand that if you have fly C, what happens? If you do not have this flagellin, what happens in the system? Uh, so uh, what happened is that, that if you indeed look for all the CFU, so again, it is the calculation of the CFU here and the calculation of the CFU, first you look here look at this particular graph. Calculation of the CFU per gram of the potting mixture. Now the potting mixture, you will have all these certain ratios of your vermiculite, perlite, manure, etc., etc. And uh, then you can put up your own controls and your own experiments and you will see that the, uh, the CFU of the potting mixture without the membrane, it is indeed very, very high. But uh, when you put the, uh, uh, the polythene sheet or the 0.2 micron membrane, then slowly the CFU almost is nil because nothing can migrate. And the 0.2 uh, uh, and the 6 micron, you have this very beautifully. So this shows very nicely that indeed it is migrating. Now, is the migrating happening due to what reason? Uh, is it some kind of the factors in the soil which is making them to migrate? Like, you know, like an insect slowly crawling and migrating. Or it is indeed certain uh, attractive factors which are coming uh, from the root exudates which are making them to migrate. Now, if you look into this wild type, it's extremely clear that when you have these uh, migration of your bacteria, when you are trying to understand the migration of the bacteria, uh, without plant in this particular particular graph where I'm pointing, the bar where I'm pointing here, without plant, there is no migration, which means that the root exudates in the third one is the major cause of these migrations or with plant. So the with plants, the migration is excellent. And with root exudates, the migration is excellent, which again proves that it is indeed certain attractive molecules which are there in the root exudates, pure root exudates, which are also produced by the plant. So plant is your very important control here. And it is allowing the bacteria to beautifully migrate. And when you have, this is a, just a mock where you definitely do not see any, uh, any uh, migration and a positive control of 0.1% glucose because this is a beautiful attractive agent for most of the bacteria to migrate. So the CFU of the inner, uh, the ratio of the CFU of the inner to the CFU of the outer, you should see this very wonderfully demonstrated by the wild type salmonella. And this particular migration or the inner to the outer ratio is almost kind of retained when you have FLJB because in the FLJB, particular FLJB mutant, it looks like that your it is not like your flysy mutant where your uh, flagellin is not at all produced. But when you have your flagellin mutant, a pure mutant of the flagellin mutant, then you see that everything is dampened, which again shows the importance of the flagella. So just try to capture this in the mind. It is an interplay between the root exudates and the flagella. This interplay from the host and from the pathogen is something which is uh, very uh, interesting to study. So the host and the pathogen plays both of them, they are playing an equal role in attracting the bacteria towards itself. 
And when you have the double knockout, indeed, it is true. So flagellin is the most important molecule. So it is migrating. It is migrating and the flagellin is the important uh, uh, you know, protein or important component which is playing a role in the migration. So, so far, so good. Uh, it is uh, definitely migrating and the flagellar mediated motility is indeed very important for the soil. Now, the question is that uh, does it even adhere to the soil particles? Salmonella, let me tell you, is a fascinating bug. I am, you know, I am a person of microbiology expertise, and my love for the salmonella is not because it is living in a vacuole, by the way, but because it is so intelligent. So are other pathogens too, but it, it takes care of everything that comes to it. You take vermiculite or perlite or manure, it will show its amazing same pattern of attachment. Hmm? So this is a scanning electron microscopy of addition of two different other, uh, you know, the um, uh, material like vermiculite or perlite or uh, organic manure. In the, uh, but of course, the organic manure gives it a amazing site of attachment and maybe enrichment looks like because if you indeed look into the log CFU per gram of the soil, and if you start uh, using a variable of either keeping the uh, perlite as a variable or vermiculite as a variable or organic matter as a variable, keeping others constant, you will see that the organic matter, when you vary, you have an amazing enrichment or the amazing uh, proliferation or the log CFU per gram of the soil increases, showing that organic matter is not only giving it a site for addition, but also a very good source for them, their life, you know, their proliferative life is very, very well intact in organic manure. So the use of organic manure, again, in our agriculture field, which is giving it a hold and a substratum for the salmonella and maybe other pathogens is also one of the factor for enriching them. So uh, the organic manure should be indeed free of salmonella so that no further enrichment can happen. But that's a different question that uh, here we are talking about few grams of soil. You will, uh, agriculture scientists may laugh at me saying, what are you talking? We are talking about acres and acres. You, you give us a strategy to figure out in this acres and thousands of acres of land, how do we go about? So give us a strategy, give us a method to immediately go to the field, sample the soil and tell whether I have salmonella or not. And I am actually waiting for that. You know, all the rest is all fine. This is limited. But if you want to really take forward, uh, we have to really think of those acres. It is all about the volume. Huh? But this uh, research is extremely important for us to understand. So the SEM imaging are wonderfully showing the same at uh, that it is indeed true that organic matter is there. And now in the, uh, the tomato field soil, now suppose if you grow tomato in this soil, you can imagine what will happen to our tomatoes, you know, beautiful tomatoes. Uh, Salmonella contains a genes which are extremely important for them to adhere because it has a wonderful capacity to make biofilms or micro colonies. Hmm? So the micro colonies is a term which is used when you make the, uh, the interaction of salmonella with the animal system uh, or maybe now with the plant system, now that we know that it is a plant with the plant system. So the salmonella addition mechanism is one of the most important addition mechanism and most important for the salmonella to make a microcolony for further infection. Uh, there are many systems. So there are MZ OMPAR system, which is a two component system. And this two component system actually takes care of many things. It's a nutrition depletion or the osmotic stress in the soil. And this particular uh, stimuli, environmental stimuli, will upregulate one of the much celebrated master regulator, CHT, uh, CSTD. And this is a master regulator for bioflame, microcolony, you name it, producing uh, the cellulose, and uh, which is encoded by BCSA. Now, this cellulose production is also very important for them to adhere. And because the bacteria can make and break biofilm, right? So it's not only the cellulose, but in animal system, you have a fimbria and uh, you also have the, the, uh, the curly uh, amyloid, curly fibrils and the uh, curly fibers. They all uh, contribute to making these laid down adhesion site or the attachment site. And uh, now what happens now if you make a mutation in these two important cues, that is a, make a mutation in the MZ system 
or make a uh, mutant in the csgd system if you make a mutant in the csg csgd system you will see that in fact it is just not adhering but how will you do the experiment simple experiment but very elegant i love this experiment mix it with soil mix your salmonella with soil and pour water and then just measure the uh, the uh, the salmonella which comes out in your flow through now if it has adhered very well see for example if it has adhered very well in the soil to the soil particles the simple water will not uh, is not able to make the salmonella come in the flow through it will not and uh, that is the reason that uh, the irrigation water uh, can it be actually very dangerous because if it is first of all contaminated it will give more seed for the uh, salmonella to become enriched and somehow this irrigation water and the attachment of the salmonella to wild type salmonella will give it a much much stronger hold and the enrichment site for them to further proliferate so but if you do not have these genes uh, think simple if you do not have these genes bcsa or mz or the csgd what happens look at these same images the very heavy attachment and enrichment just does not happen here and everything in fact comes through the almost everything comes through the flow through so it is just coming through the flow through all of them except the wild type so showing that that the wild type with the help of these adhesion genes adhesion genes is not only important in the animal system but it is extremely important in the chain from the soil then from propagating to the plants and these thus becomes important virulence factor not only for the animals but also in the agriculture and this again will be need to be studied in greater details to understand that how this microcolony behavior and etc the behavior happens so how is this trans kingdom cycle working you are going to pot a plant suppose which is uh, in the presence of salmonella and then the plant will kind of uh, mature right the plant will be having uh, uh, its uh, it will develop it will have its uh, fruits flowers it will have its fruits and when you try to calculate the cfu of the salmonella which was coming from the soil of course because the soil is in, uh, uh, is spiked up uh and in different crop number you understand this crop number very well what is defined by the crop number the first crop second crop third crop fourth crop fifth crop sixth crop you will see that every crop number this root uh, cfu nicely increases so is the leaf so are the stems uh, so are the fruits so are the flowers and the stems because it is a kind of a transit you know the passage to go it is very much uh, important to know that where do we capture that stem it has to definitely go through the stem if it is get, uh, coming through the root it has to go through the stem so the stem life it's like a bacteremic phase you know if you take an analogy it is like a bacteremic phase so we must find bacteria in the blood and but it is uh, a time that when we can capture uh, before it get disseminate into organs like liver spleen here it is getting disseminated into organ like leaf fruit flowers like that uh, but it is all coming through the root so the systemic infection is just the beautiful analogy that you can draw from the human that it is indeed causing this kind of a systemic infection and if you now start feeding these infected uh, flowers and the fruits and the leaves crush them up and feed to the mouse which is our um, amazing animal model because the mouse dies from salmonella infection then what do you see you see that indeed their cfu in spleen and in the liver increases dramatically the infected ones you see this this is increasing dramatically but not the mock uh, which what does it show so if you give them beautiful nice tomato an infected tomato or in, in an infected leaf or an infected fruit grind them and feed them they are very happy but if you give them those infected tissues you see that the establishment of the infection is setting in showing that if now field rat eat your contaminated fruit they are going to harbor them and not only they will harbor but they will disseminate it into their distant organ like spleen or the liver and also they will shed it in the fecal pellet 
Now the fecal pellet is the source of reservoir for the infection next round and a source of enrichment because the fecal pellets are now getting mixed with the soil. And more and more you started mixing this fecal pellet, more and more becomes the enrichment. Now just think of all of these small lab scale experiment, you think in your acres land, how is it going to get amplified? And this amplification is coming from here. Is it coming from a lot of these field animals which are feeding on our contaminated fruit? Their feces are getting mixed up with the soil. And then it is again going, the cycle is going on and on. And no doubt that it is all going very stealthy because the crops looks very good. Now, if you really look into this infected, uh, uh, the CFU, the roots, they have the very, very high CFU per fresh weight, the leaves too, and the fruits too. But there must be, now looks like there is a second line of thought that there must be a way by which the plant immunity is kind of a trigger. You see the root is the highest. Of course, it's entering through the lateral roots, but by the time it reaches the fruits and maybe it is uh, the, the CFU indeed is uh, dropping, but it does not mean that it is clear. This much amount may be good enough to make anybody sick. But the question here is, is there a way by which we can understand that how the plant triggered immunity. In fact, now it's taking care because the host defense system will kick in. That we need to understand from the host point of view. And how is it kicking in? And is that the reason that uh, you do get, you know, a less, uh, uh, less, you know, uh, less burden in your leaves and in the fruit? And of course, there are a lot of experiments to be done to understand this particular concept. So uh, now from the oral, oral route, uh, of infection, that means if you feed them uh, the fecal, uh, the, the plant, you know, so the, uh, the plants are potted into your uh, contaminated soil, and then you feed orally those fruits to the uh, animal, and the fecal matters which the animal is shedding contains the bacteria, which goes again into the soil, and the cycle continues and continues. So the trans kingdom cycle is indeed very fascinating. It is just that it was a matter of thought. It may be happening from ages together. And that is how everything got so much, you know, uh, kind of accounted for. Uh, but uh, we did not know the mechanism. And now we definitely know the mechanism. Now that we know the mechanism, can we indeed break the cycle? That is the important part. Can we indeed break the cycle? So there may be many eco-friendly measures to break the cycle. You can have plant-derived metabolites. You can have certain competing microbes. And you can have small molecule inhibitors uh, and competing microbes are there. You know, soil is the most holy grail and a resource of many of these uh, unutilized microbiota, unknown antagonists, because till now, till now, right from uh, the, you know, discovery of the, uh, of the antibiotic, which kills the mycobacteria by Salzman, uh, to now, we do not know much about soil microbiology. Salzman got his Nobel Prize because he's a soil microbiologist and his student, Albert Schatz, in fact, have discovered, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the antibiotic. But, uh, but anyway, the, it went to him, but they are all soil microbiologists. So soil is, soil is your golden a uh, golden sample in your hand, but we don't know much about the soil. Sorry to say that we just does not understand much about the soil. So uh, these are many ways, but one of the way is a utilization of the resistant plant in the cropping system, because uh, this was a very intelligent idea. And these ideas will take a lot of time, but this somehow worked very well. Now, what was that intelligent idea and how it, how it came across is that when Kapudeep was working and looking at all the salad vegetables, and among the salad vegetables, cucumber, cabbage, cauliflower, coriander, carrot, beetroot. Now beetroot, you know, is a very nice salad vegetable. What he figured out that only in this particular uh, family of beta vulgaris, the bacterial burden or the CFU per gram of the fresh uh, weight, uh, root fresh weight, that was decreased. Now, the question immediately stuck him that why did it, why did only this particular beta vulgaris decreased, but all the others were quite nice. I mean, not that dramatic decrease and they were all quite nicely supporting. Why this beetroot decreased? Uh, searching this beetroot and because he found the dead bacteria. So all the green ones that you are seeing is our wonderful GFP bacteria. 
and the, the, the yellow one here is the dead bacteria because the dead bacteria is going to take up the PI stain also and then they will appear as uh, yellow. So he saw the yellow bacteria, so much of yellow bacteria in the beetroot and immediately it stuck him that what is it in the beetroot now? Here the research began. How the beetroot can kill salmonella? Then he took the root exudates. He had done many different kinds of extractions, the methanol extraction, the ethanol extraction, water or the PBS. And he figured out that it is the methanol extraction, which in fact, uh, 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 you know, all the, these three different extractions and the CFU per ml. Methanol and the ethanol extractions somehow kind of either destroyed or did not retain the activity. But the water extraction amazingly retained the killing activity of salmonella. And so the water uh, is uh, extraction or the water uh, exudate, root exudate in the water is the most important uh, substratum or the sample for us now to further understand that what is it, what is it? And uh, I think the research will go on and on to understand that what is it in this water extraction, which is going to which is killing the salmonella. Now that you know with all these experiments, what is the smartest way and the quickest way to answer and have a strategy of controlling them? That is none other than first, culturing. Now you see here that if you have the salmonella grown in the presence of X fold or the increasing fold of the beetroot extract, uh, you will see that indeed there is a decrease in the burden of salmonella showing that the beetroot extract, the root exudates, definitely have something to do with the anti-salmonella activity. Now, is it anti-salmonella activity or is it, uh, you know, taking a toll on all the uh, other population? That is very important, right? Because you are all agriculture scientists sitting there and you will question me, it's great that you're doing it, but what happens to our beneficial organism? If you are killing them, then why, uh, why we have to plant them? Co, uh, co plan them, but you will also not uh, shout at me because you will also would like to culture the beetroot, right? Because beetroot is one of the very important crop. So, what can be the one which is uh, uh, which can uh, be used? There can be many ways. There is a mixed cropping, intercropping, and the biocontrol plants. All these three categories we call them as a co transplantation because you are putting both these crops together. You know, and when you say crop rotation, it is a solo transplantation. Solo transplantation means you are putting one crop and then only you are putting after that crop is harvested, taken away, field cleaned, you are putting the other crop. But co-transplantations, you can have mixed cropping in between. You can have intercropping one row of each or you can have a biocontrol plant. That means you are using that plant only as a control. Now, if you see here two tomatoes or a tomato with a beetroot or two beetroot and only a fallow. So this is the experimental setup. And the uh, if you really look over a period of time, the log CFU per gram of soil, total, total log CFU, which is nothing to do with salmonella here. It is the CFU of everything per gram of soil. You see that indeed, uh, 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 with the beetroot, indeed, it is uh, kind of a decreasing. And uh, with the cucumber and with the tomato, it is uh, less decreasing. But with the beetroot, it is indeed a decreasing. Now, what is it that is decreasing? So salmonella, nitrogen fixers, fluorescent pseudomonads, total aerobic bacteria, total fungal burden, all was tested. Now, with the beetroot, and fallow is always a very important control. Now, when you plant beetroot and, and the salmonella, you will see that the salmonella burden indeed comes down with the beetroot. It does not come down with the tomato alone, but it comes down again when you do a co-cultivation of a beetroot and a tomato. But the nitrogen fixer, so it is extremely important with the, because the nitrogen fixers are the most uh, important uh, organisms that are there in your soil. Uh, the nitrogen fixers somehow are just not getting hampered. So it is a very, very good news that uh, beetroot is not bringing down the nitrogen fixers. But what brings down are the fluorescent pseudomonads. So the fluorescent pseudomonads are drastically brought down by the beetroot alone. Tomato doesn't bring it down. And the moment you do a co-culture of the beetroot and the tomato together, 
you will see that there is a rescue of this drastic decrease, which is again a very good news because the uh, pseudomonads are also extremely important. The presence of fluorescent pseudomonads are very important in the soil. Uh, so the co-culture again is creating, is proving to be very, very helpful for uh, the tomato and also retaining and rescuing some of these fluorescent pseudomonads. Now the total aerobic bacteria, also if you see that it is bringing down a bit, it is brought down a bit by the beetroot, that means looks like beetroot does have a detrimental effect on this, not only on the pathogen salmonella, but also on the important soil microbe like fluorescent pseudomonads and the total aerobic bacterial count comes down. But tomato does not, and the moment you co-culture them, your soil consortium of the total aerobic bacteria is restored. And uh, this is again, an extremely important observation and very important point to be noticed that this co-culture will not destroy your soil consortium, which you and me as an agriculture scientist may worry about. And when you talk about this total fungal burden, Beetroot does not do much to the uh, total uh, fungal burden, but this fungal burden is a little bit, uh, it is, uh, you know, it is just not uh, uh, much making much difference. So the most important difference that is brought about is uh, by the beetroot alone is a total aerobic bacteria and the fluorescent pseudomonads, which can be rescued by co-planting them or co-cropping them with tomato. And if you now look in this wonderful imagination or the web diagram, which Kapudeep is very good at. He's extremely good at making data uh, and putting them in the you know various forms uh, so that uh, not only it becomes very easy to understand, but it makes a big sense when you talk about the dimensions, you talk about the uh, length, instead of putting all in the bar, he has come up with this amazing web diagram and it is so easy to understand here. If you have only beet and the red is beet and tomato, and if you see here, when it is only beet, the, the, the chlorophyll and the number of the leaves, everything is in the higher periphery. And when you have beet plus tomato, for the beet itself, the petiole length and the yield and the leaf area and the number of leaves, everything is decreased for the beet. Yeah? So you don't think about tomato now, you only think about the beet. So beet alone is amazing, but when you have beet plus tomato, the productivity of the beet is going down. And also, but when you look into the time of flowerings in terms of tomato uh, uh, and the tomato plus uh, beet together, then you will see that the number of branches or the, and the number of the fruits or the yield, etc., of the tomato is extremely high when you have this co-culture of, uh, of this beet and tomato. Now, the consequences of the co-cultivation uh, may be uh, now thought of it in a very different way. First of all, what are you harvesting? That is what you need to think of. What are you harvesting? You are harvesting tomatoes. So you are not harvesting beet here. You are harvesting tomatoes, but you are using the beet as a biocontrol. So you don't have to worry about harvesting beet because when you see Indeed, when it is solo transplantation, your beets are very big and very beautiful. But when it is co, they, there is a reduced uh, size of the beet. There is also, uh, you know, the size, if you look into this chlorophyll content and if you look into the size of the leaf in co-transplantation or the length of the petiole, everything is decreased. There is no doubt in that. But you're not uh, going to be worrying about the beet here. What are you going to really look forward are the tomatoes. Are your tomatoes getting benefited? Indeed, it is getting benefited. Now, these biocontrol plants, use of the beet as a biocontrol plant is benefiting tomato and is going to protect the crop, the tomato, the harvest, or the fruit harvest, the size of the fruit of the tomato. Everything is wonderful when you grow them in the presence of beet and the contaminated uh, soil contaminated with salmonella. So your tomato is indeed protected. So there is no harm by putting these beet in between the, uh, the tomato for harvesting the tomato. And this humble beet plant is coming to our rescue here and rescuing us uh, from the infection of tomato uh, by salmonella. So beetroot became now an extremely important bio, uh, the, the biocontrol plant. And again, uh, our, our reporter was very, very fast to report this. 
And this particular report, in fact, now had created a big wave in those belts where they are growing the uh, tomatoes. And they, uh, they are actually, they told me that they are not worrying whether their, salmonella, their, their field is contaminated with salmonella or not. As a precautionary measure, they are always putting the uh, beetroot along with the uh, tomato. And just with that notion in mind that even if it is there, salmonella is there, my tomatoes will be protected and it will not create any harm to uh, the tomato. And if salmonella is there, it will protect the, uh, the tomatoes from the salmonella. So uh, let me finish my talk here. Uh, microbes work in collaboration. And just now I finished my coursework in many universities and you know the first one topic that interested everybody is the microbial community behavior that we call it as a quorum sensing. Microbes are not a unicellular bacterium. Their quorum sensing and their community behavior is extremely important for them to do what they are doing. And so we, so, uh, uh, we microbiologists, we microbiologists always try to form a quorum and somehow get together. We have a very great capacity to adhere to each other with the help of these biofilm forming genes maybe. So you can see here that how amazing is our adhering capacity, adherence capacity. Uh, Professor Utpalnath, Professor Usha Vijayaragavan um, from our IISC, Professor Natraj, Professor Iranna, Professor Prakash, and Professor Nagraj from GKVK. And now, uh, maybe in my next talk, I will have one big slide about our Uttar Bongo Krishi Vishwavidyalaya. I am really looking forward to interact with all of you and to you know collaborate further. So this is our amazing uh, adhesion capacity and the quorum that we have now to to get our plant work uh, in place and Keithi and my many other colleagues who are now showing really great interest is joining in. I'm very thankful to the Department of Biotechnology, Science and Technology, DAE for all the funding and all my extremely wonderful lab members. So these are all the uh, past lab members in my lab and all of them are faculties. So I have uh, my first student Sandeep who is a faculty in my own department, biochemistry. Uh, IISC, MBBS doctor, got interested into big cis sciences. Uh, Amit is a, a scientist uh, E2 in CDRI Lucknow. Uh, Priyanka, is she changed her field and she was in Singapore and then she studied her MBA. She, she did her CAT, etc. Namrata was in Brown University now in Dublin. Uh, Mayuri is doing in MRC. Vidya, who is here with me. Uh, Vidya is an uh, uh, assistant professor in NIT Raulkela, then uh, Uday in uh, in Nel University of Nellore, uh, Debulina in Emory, our Arjun uh, doing his postdoc uh, in Sweden, and uh, uh, Anantha Lakshmi became a, a very interested, uh, and she's an entrepreneur by heart, so she actually has uh, is using her all her uh, strategies of PhD now to get into something very interesting with Microsoft. And uh, Arvind, he's the first veterinary doctor that I had, an extremely great person. Uh, Arvind is still in Yale University and is established, uh, is establishing now himself. And uh, uh, Chandrajit uh, was a postdoc, Srinandan and Chandrajit, the two postdocs. He is a faculty in Shastra and uh, Chandrajit is in Indonesia. And uh, Sandhya is a faculty in Bits Pilani. Uh, Rajiv uh, worked with a lot with the nanoscience who is now there in uh, Ramaya, assistant professor. Then uh, Preeti, uh, my very good colleague who worked a lot on these uh, biofilm properties. And uh, she is now doing her second postdoc in US. Divya Prakash came back to the Shastra. Sangeeta is a uh, amazing writing skill. So she has changed her profession to a scientific writing in US, settled in US. Akshay is the one who is working a lot on with the shockwave uh, mediated delivery and uh, making a lot of new generation machines. And of course, so you can imagine all these ones for long two decades, uh, one decade, we had all these plant bio uh, pl animal biologists and working on the salmonella animal system and then joined Kapudeep and we started working on the plant. And these present, are the, they are the present colleagues of mine, uh, uh, Kasturi, Dipushri, Atish, Devopriya, uh, Ritika, Kirti. Uh, Kirti is there in the audience now. She's the one who is continuing. Abhilash, Umesh, Ria, the two, two new joins in my lab, Ria and 2020 and Anmol Singh. Anmol Singh's photo came late and by the time he sent, I have already loaded my slides. So Anmol, so these are my two new colleagues. 
and kirti is the one who is going to uh, you know take the work forward so i am always extremely lucky to have my young colleagues who have been like a pillar and uh, with their very interesting ideas and very vibrant discussions that we have in the lab the journey is extremely uh, exciting so thank you all for listening and now i am open to question hello colleagues i am open to questions now thank you hello. everybody hello. yes you audible madam is it audible yes i am audible i you are audible you are audible thank you thank you very much uh, dr chakravarti for your very nice informative and vibrant speech and of course the students uh, of the other faculties and the members of the committee will be enriched with this by this time uh, we have dr chattopadhyay he is basically a plant pathologist so before entering into the student side i like to hear that uh, comments and to interact with you for the timing sir Please. sure 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 thank you so much yes actually i'm looking forward for your help uh, very important help you know because you can understand my constraint uh we have some constraint though we have a great collaboration with professor natraj iranna everybody in gk vk uh but we still do have a constraint and uh, it is not just about the constraint it is all about doing this wonderful work with all of you you know you are all very bright colleagues here young minds so uh, it would be amazing to uh, venture at the outset madam a big thank you You. Uh, thank you thank you sir uh, thank you uh, i can tell you uh, you had this particular student as well sitting uh, and listening to the lecture it was really amazing uh, to you um, i cannot pardon myself being late for this i joined when you were explaining the methodology particularly the lab techniques um i particularly emphasize a lot on the lab that has to be very important it is less important what you achieve it's more important how you achieve methodology is extremely important and uh, that become makes things more convincing for you know people who finally evaluate our, our and even the impact of our study um for that matter it was a uh, different day for me earlier i started the day managing you know how we manage the crop residue burning where also the microbes are extremely important in decomposing uh, the uh, crop residues i was we were discussing on the possible like microorganisms and then when i entered here it was extremely thrilling um i keenly look forward to your you know joining us because you are very close bank within bangalore and now having we having plucked uh, dr kapudeep out of your lab to our and planted him sir him sir to wkb um at the outset we are at this point of time looking at uh, his establishing the lab and all the biosafety protocols in place uh, which are still to really make uh, sound i think what the public needs of the job of it and with your ample guidance i think he's already you are also in touch with him. um why you know we would be more interested and it would also be interesting for you we were just mentioning about rajasthan and i have been to have the experience of serving in rajasthan for 10 years almost 10 years and i think why rajasthan has made your story more important and so will kuch bhi hai to because Both these places have a huge, you know, uh, uh, you know, little underground contamination. Do you really agree? You know, there is a lot of problem in Rajasthan, and that is one big reason why uh, you know you have 
Chattopadhyaya, I think that is indeed a very, uh, very, very encouraging that, uh, you know, at the right time, we all got connected together because uh, you can understand that what is the strength of, uh, you know, coming together is just like uh, microbial strength of community behavior. So <laughs> I strongly feel that it is a sense of coming together. And uh, now uh, I also feel very strongly that with all the inputs from uh, you as agriculture scientist, you will be able to tell us that you, yes, indeed. See, we do a lot of basic research. We are using everything uh, to understand the processes, the phenomena. But how is it going to be important uh, for uh, you when we want to really take it on a bigger scale? So that bigger scale issue will be, in fact, told by you all. So I am really very, indeed, very, very happy to get connected to all of you through Kapudip. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Chaturvedi, and at the same time, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Chaturvedi, our noble Vice Chancellor. I'll surely keep my mind the suggestions uh, the, that he has put forth in this forum or the future course of action. Now, I like to invite one or two questions uh, from the student side. Uh, if they want to interact with Dr. Uh, Chaturvedi, uh, the. Can we ask one question? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. And it's wonderful always to listen to you. And uh, I think I congratulate you and Kapudu for this wonderful work. Uh, my, I have a small question, ma'am. Yeah. Is the yeah. literal root entry when you have checked? Yeah. Did you check for the typhi also, or do they have any like the chance of uh, the typhi also to enter? Oh yeah. Actually, Kapudu uh, was doing on typhi, and uh, that is what was the first question. You know what we brought in mind that. You, you know very well. I mean, we have been all working together for long that there is no model for typhi, right? So at least one hinge, one hinge of hope that plant becomes a model for typhi, we are just it. So Kapudeep started. It does show chlorosis. Kapudeep, can you chip in here a little bit? Uh, Kapudeep has done that and it has shown chlorosis. So, uh, but uh, it is not like uh, typhi murium. Kapudeep, you can chip in here. Yeah, actually, uh, the type C type medium both enter through the lateral root mediated tree. Hello? Yeah, yeah. My order? Huh. Yeah, actually, yeah. both these the capacitance, type C and type C medium, they enter via the lateral root mediated entry. 
and uh, as compared to uh, this uh, type new murium type causes less fluorosis and the cfp is also less but it is indeed infecting you know vidya right. so right. in fact uh, with a little bit of more uh, ethical not ethical but the safety process in place you know how difficult it will be to do typhi with uh, plant right yeah. yeah and then these autoclaving etc so with little bit more safety process in place we will take it forward yeah, but it's good to know that even yeah. the typhi is uh, yes. the same route so yes like yes okay. and we could not do it with tomato we could not it was just in arabidopsis that they, they showed lesser degree of chlorosis but you never know but putting typhi in soil people will kill me here <laughs> <So> <laughs> with typhi murium itself we had so much of issue i know so that is why i am seeking help uh, okay. your uh, ubkv and uh, our gkvk gkvk is kind of out of question but ubkv i am really hoping forward okay thank you so much thank you anybody else anybody else would like to interact hello 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 hello, hello. Can you hear me, ma'am? Yeah, yeah, Nandita, I can hear you. Please go ahead. Yeah, this is Nandita from Hello, Biochemistry, ma'am. Hi, yeah. Hi, ma'am. Ma'am, ma'am, hi. I'm having two questions. First, uh, is your study suggestive that organically grown uh, salad vegetables can be uh, a source of uh, you know infection by the bacteria than the inorganically grown? one mm. and exactly. this is the first question and mm. because that raises a lot of concern because nowadays yes. it is a it is the uh, i mean era of organic vegetables this mm. is one question and second is uh, uh, is there any kind of study that has been done worldwide to identify any resistance to soil like uh, the screening of different cultivars wild one cultivated one in tomato or in any other uh, crop where a source for uh, salmonella uh, resistance uh, is been already identified or in place this is the two questions i have because okay. that can be done here because we have a lot of action for tomato as well as the other salmonellaceous crop like chili and others so huh. a screening of uh, these uh, cultivars for the source of resistance can be uh, performed that's why i'm putting forward the question thank you ma'am yeah. thank you nandita both questions are very important i will answer one by one so first question was is whether your organically grown vegetables they are more prone i would actually this is very important question and i would say yes just because it is organic does not mean that it is yes. uh, free of everything Good. pesticide it can yes. be free of but not of uh, the these pathogens like salmonella until and unless we know that the organic manure that is being used is in fact free of this pathogen and till that yes. time uh, i don't think that we no. should take them for granted and Nobody simply does eat that. yeah no no that is important question and that is why we are into sensor making uh, with one of our collaborating department in electronic systems and engineering uh, so that you know it can be just uh, you know acres of land i mean you just you need to do is just put that soil sample or manure sample and tell machine should tell us that yes you have salmonella there and that's it that's yes. that is that is a need of the hour so it is indeed your first question is very valid second question is very important and kapudeep actually had started working on the cultivar so he asked a question of cultivar and zero var you know there are certain strains of uh, salmonella and certain cultivars of tomato which are resistant to salmonella so uh, that work okay. is in fact going on and uh, we will take it take it forward now we have one student who joined from your institute as integrated phd student shom so shom is uh, joining the lab for rotation and uh, okay. i was also thinking that you know a couple of your students they can come and then they can uh, get uh, trained in our lab and vice versa some of our student can mm -hmm. go to your place uh, and get trained yes kirti will come sometime and so uh, yes it is being started and there is a very promising difference between the zero war cultivar story yeah so you do have uh, the okay. the resistant tomato plants here yeah. Yeah. So, um, if the, is there any comparative study yet uh, between the resistant and susceptible ones? No, I, I mean, don't. Not in, hmm. If not in India, 
Uh, no, I, okay. I am not Thanks. seeing them. I am not seeing yeah. them a really very solid literature or about these uh, resistant. There are few coming up, you know, some of these genetic mutant, maybe uh, the plant mutant uh, who are naturally resistant, but there is no indeed a very detailed study. In fact, salmonella study, if you really look the literature, no, they're very sparse. It's like very artificial study. Take the leaf, put it, uh, infect it through syringe, syringe infections or uh, in vitro, some kind of an organ infection, which are very far away from reality. So this is the, the work is very, very sparse. So that is why it is a very interesting, interesting to do. And it is very important economically, as well as if you look from the medical point of view, this is one of the most important pathogen. And that too, because of all these issues, salmonella is classified as a bioterror three category now, not even uh, bioterror two category. Uh, first of all, it was in bioterror one, so they lifted it to the bioterror category two because it can cause bioterrorism, as it is now known to cross the blood-brain oh, barrier, oh, oh, oh. extra-intestinal infections, uh, arthritis, endocarditis, too many, too many issues with salmonella. So yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, it was very nice uh, listening from you uh, after a long time. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you, Nandita. Yeah. Madam, now uh, we are actually running short of time. Now I request uh, Dr. Kapudi to summarize uh, her lecture in short, and uh, then we'll have the call. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, hello, am I audible? Sir? Yeah, you are audible, Kapudi. You can just little bit increase here. You are audible. So thank you, ma'am, for this wonderful talk. And you have definitely given a very good introduction to the Almanella, as you always do. And your favorite story that we all enjoyed, that is Mary Melon and how she transmits Almanella uh, being a chef and then moving to other places. You also suggested how irrigation water is And then... We have also shown that why salmonella is a BSA2 pathogen, what kind of biosafety are, are, are required for doing this kind, kind of work. Especially if you have to, if we have to establish the same thing in agriculture university, there needs to be a institutional biosafety committee. Moving on, you have also differentiated how phytopathogen and salmonella are different and, and how uh, salmonella utilizes natural root mediated protein. This research has definitely created an impact and the new channels and front line come out. Moving on, you have also shown to the soil scientists especially that how the in-situ progression of infection happens and how do we distinguish an enrichment versus migration. Uh, especially the attachment to the organic matter, which is very uh, important thing in today's agriculture. And then finally proving that how transcendental cycles are acting. And uh, the most interesting part was, was the how do we control the pathogen in the soil, especially by using deep root as a biocontrol measure. The, the distinguishing of, of all the cropping systems and which cropping system is the best for uh, using beetroot root and tomato program. And how various cropping systems can be beneficial in the different kinds of soil. So I thank you, ma'am, for this uh, wonderful talk. So I'll uh, move this, uh, Dr. Ganesh Pan. Good afternoon to all. It's a privilege to offer a vote of thanks uh, for today's uh, first session of this uh, webinar series. Uh, I must, uh, I extend my uh, heartful uh, thanks to our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. Jyotin Chattopadhyay. Without his extent, uh, without his help, we could not be uh, able to uh, um, organize uh, these types of uh, webinar series. And he was also present here and spent some time and has given a, uh, uh, a, a opportunity to uh, to listen to uh, Dr. Deepsha Chakravarti again uh, as uh, he, uh, she, as the person has said, that she may be introduced as a, uh, she may teach some courses in our university and will be privileged and will be happy uh, if she agrees to uh, teach some courses here. 
and i also uh, extend my thank to our dean faculty agriculture professor dibindu mukhopadhyay he is also head of our department and also coordinator of this webinar series and uh, he has extended a lot of thing actually he was the actual uh, he was the actual man of organizing uh, this webinar series uh, and i also uh, extend my uh, thanks to the other teams the deans of faculty horticulture the deans of faculty technology uh, the director of science education uh, the director of research uh, they have uh, helped us a lot uh, while organizing this webinar series and and, the, uh, and professor avas kumar sinha uh, is a as a code uh, he is the coordinator of this webinar series and i also thank to other members of our department and dr uh, shobhik dev dr amit tamang dr tapos uh, uh, dr tapos pandit uh, and uh, and also anarul for the help uh, to organize uh, this seminar and thank you all and last lastly i must thank dr dipsha jokroti for sharing her uh, uh, first time from her busy schedule and and for her very informative and very useful lectures and we have learned a lot of things about salmonella and how it affects the plant plant system as well as the uh, animal systems and thank you all thank you thank you Now, very much thank you complete here and next we will start at 1 pm thank you madam thank you thanks all take care bye bye
Hello, Gaurav sir, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Ha. Ah, Gaurav sir is on. <coughs> hello hello dr sharma is it audible yeah yeah it's audible thank you sir. okay okay uh this is professor dibindu mukhopadhyay head department of soil science agricultural chemistry and dean faculty of agriculture so good afternoon everybody we are on the initiation of the second lecture to be delivered by dr gorav sharma Institute of Bioinformatics and Applied Biotechnology, Bangalore, and I welcome you, sir. And I also welcome our all the faculties, deans, dignitaries, director of research, and students, participants uh, for this special lecture. Now I is over to Dr. Kapoori to introduce uh, Dr. Sharma. Sure, please. Am I audible to everyone? Yeah. So uh, it's a privilege. Dr. Gaurav Sharma is a DSC inspired faculty at India at the Institute of Bioinformatics and Applied Biotechnology. He did his PhD from CSIR Institute of Microbial Technology, Chandigarh. Then he moved to the Department of Microbiology and Molecular Genetics, University of California, as a postdoctoral fellow under Chair Singh. He worked on Mixtococcus species using sensory system and its specialized uh, developmental cell type. Approach. He got the expertise in. Understanding the diversity and evolution of various genes and their ecological functions. Thereafter, he moved to India and joined IBAB as the PhD inspired faculty from 2019 to till date. He received various travel awards like Emma Travel Award, UC Davis Postdoctoral Scholar Travel Award, and Postdoctoral Travel Award, Science Communication. His current research involves metagenomics. Metagenomics, genomics, transcriptomics, microbial evolution, and computational bi biology. With, with this, he, uh, he explored various other uh, various microbes. So today, he will be talking on uh, how genomics can be used for soil microbiology. Over to you, Karo sir. Okay. Thank you, Kapudeep, and <clears throat> thank you. Mm -hmm. Devendu Mukhopadhyay sir for inviting me to this uh, online lecture series and it's really a pleasure to talk to all the faculty members and uh, all the students in, uh, in UBKV. Okay, so I will just share my screen quickly. Okay, I hope my screen is visible to all of you. Okay. Visible. Okay. Great, great. So let me just put this thing in the corner. Just a minute. Just want to put it somewhere where it's not visible. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, as Kapudeep ha has already introduced me, I am working at uh, IBAB as a faculty uh, as a faculty scientist, and uh, I have joined here 1.5 years before. And before that, uh, my expert, I was major, my research work was majorly focused on uh, microbial genomics uh, and evolution. But now, from last one and a half year, I'm trying to move into plant into metagenomics, microbiome, and all these kind of analysis. So today, uh, my talk will be majorly focused on a review kind of uh, perspective 
or which I want to portray here in front of all of you who are majorly working on soil science and uh, uh, chemistry. So this talk is about uh, how we can use computational biology as a tool to identify and characterize all these microbes in any niche, okay? We can talk about any niche, either soil or animal gut or, you know, even your laptop screen, okay? Because uh, there are many type of cultured and non uncultured bacteria present in any kind of niche and using experimental science most of the time we cannot identify those uncultured bacteria but using computational biology it gives us an advantage in which we can identify most of those uncharacter uncharacterized or uncultured bacteria too okay so that's why my talk title is metagenomics and identification and characterization of microbes via computational biology and uh, again i just want to quickly say that we are hiring and uh, if there are msc students who has their own fellowship i have two wonderful projects on which i want to work on and uh, I, i'm sure it will be a great experience for those candidates and uh, <clears throat> a one quick thing which i have portrayed here is gaurav sharma phd but i am not alone here okay so I am present along with my microbiome. So, and you will realize when, when I will start uh, going deeper in the presentation that why I'm saying this. So just to quick introduce where I am. So this is Bangalore and we are present in south of the Bangalore, IBAB. It's a wonderful small institute with uh, 20 faculties and around uh, 150 students. And uh, my lab, the, the focus of my research is uh, microbes, their genomics and evolution. So we try to identify a diversity of microbes. They try to use a lot of genomics data, transcriptomics data, metagenomics data, and then try to predict how those microbes have evolved during time. And uh, in, as I told you that till 2019, till 2019, I was majorly foc focusing on mixobacteria. These are soil bacteria, non-pathogenic bacteria, but the most important aspect about these bacteria is that their genome and I'm sure you know the genome, their genomes are four times bigger as compared to E. coli or bacillus. So I'm sure you know, you know about E. coli and bacillus. They are like very um, abundant organisms and most studied organism in uh, research. However, these organism mixobacteria, their genome size can go up to 16 MB, which is uh, even some of the lower eukaryotes like yeast or uh, some fungi, they are smaller than these organisms. So they have several physiological properties. They do fruiting body formation. They do biofilm formation. They make, uh, they do gliding motility, adventurous motility and social motility, two type of gliding motility. They secrete slime. They do predation of some small bacteria. So they have like so many extracurricular properties. And we are trying to understand that how these organisms evolved all those properties. And uh, we are using computational tools to do that. Another organism in which uh, I, I became interested in 2019 was uh, family Vibrionaceae members. And I'm sure Vibrio organisms, they don't need an introduction. And we are interested in understanding that how different type of signal transduction mechanisms exist in different type of Vibrio organisms. And, uh, and now, uh, as I told you that uh, we are trying to understand microbiomes and uh, I'm majorly interested in medicinal plant microbiome. And again, you know, we are planning to start it again, as you know, that, you know, because of the COVID situation, mm, these projects are kind of still on hold, but we are trying to uh, kick them start. Okay. So we are working on four type of aspects. One is microbial genomics. Another is plant genomics collaborations and prediction servers. Okay, so in microbial genomics, as I told you, our focus is on mixobacterial genomics, Vibrionaceae genomics, and we have also done some work on SARS-CoV-2 genomics. And we have published these two papers. One is in a PRJ and another is in BioArchive, but we are trying to publish it very soon. In plant genomics, my focus is on plant microbiome, their mitochondrial genomics, and to understand the plant microbe interaction. And uh, I have several, I'm working on several national and international co co uh, collaboration, including with uh, Dr. Kapudeep. And uh, we are also trying to create some prediction servers like CSS spread or Genostat, which uh, you know we will talk about at one point of time in any other presentation. Okay, so <clears throat> starting my presentation, I'm sure you all of you all you all are well aware of microbes. Okay, but the good thing about these microbes is that uh, they are everywhere. Like you tell a niche, you tell 
any ecological niche and you will find them there okay like either it's an animals marine environment human any place in human like uh, you know gut uh, nose uh, throat uh, everywhere food different food sources plant soil everywhere they are present everywhere but the question is because we are also present in all those niches animals are also present in all those niches the so the question is do we or like as a human or other organism live alone so the answer to this question is no obviously we don't live alone we each organism always keep interacting with other microbes and even eukaryotes and uh, we all live in a very cooperative society okay so even if i am standing here alone but there are many microbes which are associated with me there are many lower eukaryotes which might be associated with me and uh, we all are living in a very cooperative uh, environment all together so that's why uh, the, the theory is no organism is an island okay every organism is uh, filled with so many microbes so many lower eukaryotes and uh, that's what uh, we are trying to identify here okay so even if you see like different distributions which people have tried to find out that you know in a handful of soil like around 200 200 grams there will be around 0.5 gram of living matter okay and it includes a lot of things bacteria fungi insects arachnids so many other things okay and i'm sure you all are quite familiar with the you know the the soil profile and this is a very standard soil profile so we have surface litter we have top soil layer like humus which includes organic matter we have subsoil and then we have parent material which is hard rock or bad rock okay the interesting part is microbes are present in all these layers okay obviously they are more abundant here in the top layer but they are also present in parent parent material or this bad rock okay even now people have been suggest means as we know the biomass of uh, plants is quite higher as compared to microbes but uh, people have been suggesting and th these are new research that uh, even microbes they, they provide a very major part of this humus okay and uh, that's what uh, uh, we will see so if we just uh, have a look at uh, you know like at a plant in which is present in a soil you know those microbial communities which are associated with this plant they are uh, they are as important as those microbes which we are which are present in our guts you know like uh, uh, an human gut microbiome has been studied a lot as compared to plant microbiomes but you know these two are very separate fields and they need equal focus from uh, um, from researchers however like people are trying to find trying to do more and more research in plant microbiome recently but the point which i want to portray is that uh, microbial community in the soil is as important as one in the gut and if you see the soil component you know like uh, we have decomposing organic matter we have stabilized organic matter and we have living organisms which is around 5% but to restore our soils we need to feed the microbes to the soil okay because microbes are the one who will be mm, decomposing a lot of uh, organic material a lot of uh, mm, plant material like rotten plants or you know they will work as a saprophytic organisms which will try to uh, make the soil fert uh, fertile and uh, more productive okay so we need microbes to restore our soil to become it more uh, to make it more fertile and uh, oh, i'm sure you have heard this uh, quotation that it takes a village to make healthy soil okay so all these organisms are present in our soil or in our soil layers but fungi and micro fungi and bacteria like the major microbes they are the key factor in degrading all these organisms including plants and making the land fertile and productive and uh, there have been a lot of research going on in plant microbiome and plant metagenomics where people are trying to identify specific organisms which might be required for specific plants and we will try to you know ident uh, identify some of these aspects here but <clears throat> so now before going forward i just want to give you a you know very basic information about uh, biology or like the 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 organization of uh, uh, our cells and uh, 
DNA and chromosomes. I'm sure some of you might be aware of it, but uh, I just want to give some basic aspects uh, as uh, Kapudip told me that uh, uh, the major focus of, of uh, uh, this department is uh, on soil science and not like the, uh, the biological part. Okay, so I'm sure you all know that uh, our body or any organism's body is made up of cells. Okay, there might be, you know, a lot of like millions and billions of cells which, which make, which work as a building block to make a body. Okay, and uh, there, there is a lot of division of labor. Every, or, every organ has a different type of uh, expression of proteins and they work all together. Okay, in each cell, we have chromosomes, okay? And each chromosome is made up of very small nucleotides, okay? Like A, C, A G, C, T, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, okay? These four nucleotides made up our whole DNA, okay? Or chromosomes or the genetic material, okay? And DNA and gene can be translated into proteins and protein are the functional component of any or any it, they are the functional component of any function. So whatever is happening in our body, these proteins are the reason who are doing it. Okay. So just the basic aspects, the cell is our structure component and proteins are our functional components. Okay. And I hope you understood it, but uh, uh, feel free to ask me in between if you don't understand any concept further, because now from here onwards, I will try to bring a lot of... Uh, I will use a lot of these words and try to use computational science or try to portray information via computational biology. Okay. Okay. So I just want to quickly tell you about some basic definitions, which uh, sometimes are very confusing. And uh, until unless you don't see them side by side, you don't understand them. Okay. So when we talk about one microbe, we are just talking about one single microbe. But again, microbes are not present alone. They are also present in a complex community. Okay, so that's why we are trying to understand that how to under how to identify the components of this complex community and how to characterize those uh, organisms which are present in that complex community. Okay, so the first definition is microbiota. Okay. So if we are talk talking about any niche, any ecological niche, so there might be a lot of microorganisms present there, okay? And the community of all those microorganisms is known as microbiota, okay? So when I will be talking about microbiota, it will be the community of all microorganisms together, okay? But only microorganisms, okay? Remember that. Then we have metagenome. So metagenome is assemblies of genomes or genes from the members of microbiota okay so metagenome means all the genes or genomes which we have assembled from the microbiota so microbiota is the community metagenome is the total dna from those members then we have meta i will say microbiome first so the microbiome it includes entire habitat okay so if i'm talking about a plant Okay, if I'm talking about uh, a plant like uh, this, okay, so the microbiome, it will include the plant, the microbes, the, the genome of plant, the genome of all microbes, and all the biotic and about all the abiotic factors, such as light, how light is varying for this plant, or how, uh, wh what is the water level, how, what are the uh, concentration of different minerals. So all these aspects are considered in microbiome. So microbiome is the entire habitat, which might affect, you know, any component of that microbiome might affect the organism and its behavior. Okay. So if there is water scarcity, you know, the microbiome will become very different as compared to when water is present in abundance. Or if it become if the environment in which the plant is located it becomes anaerobic then the you know or less aerobic then the community of that uh, niche will become very different okay so that is microbiome then we have two type of uh, you know identification strategies 
in which we identify these organisms. So <clears throat> one is meta taxonomics. So meta taxonomy, I am sure you know taxonomy. So taxonomy is the classification. So uh, each organ, each uh, like we have like scientists over these, uh, you know, two, three, four, five, ten decades, they have been trying to classify all the organisms based on their properties. And uh, that is known as taxonomy. So when we, when we try to identify the taxonomy of uh, all the organisms or the microbiota based on sequencing, we call it meta taxonomics. Okay. So sometimes for meta taxonomics, we use like most of the time we use 16S RNA. Okay. So 16S R we use 16S RNA and uh, when we use 16S RNA to identify the organism abundance, we call it 16S amplicon meta taxonomics. Okay. And the other part, the second part is meta genomics which uh, I will discuss later, but metagenomics is the study of all these genomes from the microbiota. So there are two ways in which we identify or characterize microbiota. One is metataxonomics, in which we focus only on one gene, whereas in metagenomics, we focus on the whole genome. Okay. Okay. So again, the question comes, why study microbiome? Okay. Again, you know, my answer is because no organism is an island and uh, it has been portrayed over the years, uh, over the research based on, like, over the research ba based on years of uh, research that, uh, uh, you know, when, when, when any plant or any organism live in a complex community, all the factors determine its fitness. Okay. All the factors, including the you know, the abiotic factors and the biotic factors like other organisms present in vicinity. They also affect the behavior and fitness of that particular organism. So nowadays, the concept has become holobiont concept. So holobiont concept is that a complex assemblies of organisms and diverse microbial organisms present within that niche determine the fitness of that particular organism. And it includes the nuclear genome of those organisms, organelle genomes, and metagenome. Okay. So if you see here, I, I hope you will understand it, that uh, this is the host genome, like either an organism or a plant or even a, or like bacteria. And then we have mic uh, these uh, organisms which are associated or like the microbiota, which are associated with that particular host then we call it like a whole genome, okay? Like the host genome and uh, bacterial or microbiota genome, we call it whole genome. And then if we add the environmental microbiome or environmental conditions, then we call it like the total microbiome or environment, uh, to total microbiome, okay? So in this way, the concept now is that uh, all genomes which all organisms which are present all together they affect they 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 determine the fitness and survival strategy of that particular niche okay and as you can see this is a typical soil typical soil cartoon structure like uh, how, which type of organism might present here and uh, this is a uh, a, a quick representation of different type of microbiome niches or ecological niches which are present within human body. So there might be nose, mouth, lungs, stomach, colon, sexual organs, skin, and everywhere we have a different type of bacterial communities which are present there. And all those bacterial communities determine or help in determining or help in performing diverse functions. So like if they are present in nose, they will help in mucus production, or they will also secrete some antimicrobial chemicals. If they are present in lungs, they will try to lubricate pulmonary tissues. If they are present in colon, they will help in digestion of complex carbohydrates and so many, okay? So, and then if we talk about a, a standard plant uh, microbiome or, uh, you know, which kind of, uh, uh, which kinds of microbiome might exist within a plant, then you will realize that uh, we have, first of all, let's say soil microbiome, which is a rent, uh, which is a soil without any without uh, any traces of uh, that particular plant which we are studying. And uh, again, it will have its soil microbiome. Then we have rhizospheric microbiome, which is present 
near the roots of uh, that particular plant and we call it rhizosphere microbiome and then we have endophytic microbiome which might be present within roots like within inside root or inside stem or inside leaves or inside seeds or pollen everywhere and uh, again you know depending on the plant and uh, mm, uh, the the environmental conditions the endophytic microbiome of root may be very different from endophytic microbiome of stem or and simultaneously if you see there might be different type of microbes which are present on the leaf surface and we call it like phyllosphere microbiome and then we have air microbiome which is just uh, the air nearby okay so obviously air microbiome is very frequently changing always all other things are kind of uh, constant or they are slow change they are they change slowly okay so this is just a quick introduction about uh, these things and i just want to portray that uh, all these microbiome or the microbial composition of these different uh, microbiome will be will be very different from each other and uh, when we try to identify let's say if we know that uh, there is a plant and they have uh, a sp specific role let's say some medicinal plant then and their rhizomes are being used then those rhizomes might have some specific kind of bacteria which might be helping those uh, plant or helping in medicinal properties or let's say if there is a orange tree then the the, the bacteria present in those roots or in those uh, fruits might be determining different properties of oranges or flavors of oranges so all these things are kind of known for some of the plants let's say turmeric we know something for rice different type of rice let's say salt resistant rice and normal rice they have different microbes present within their uh, roots okay so again how microbes help or as i told you that uh, microbes and plant they all live in a cooperative environment okay so how they help each other or how they help plant it will be I, i'm just showing it here that uh, you know like there is a plant or there is a there is a microbiome so plant might be providing different uh, components or different uh, um, extracts which might be helpful for the microbiome okay just excuse me so plant might be secreting like root exu exudates or different phytochemicals or quorum sensing mimics and they might be helping in attracting the microbiome as uh, <clears throat> as dr deep shikha uh, was talking about that you know sometimes plant also secrete some root exudates and they allow those microbes to come near uh, to, they allow microbes to get attracted towards the plant and similarly the microbes they also secrete like different chemicals which might be helpful for the plant so sometimes they sec they secrete signaling molecules or host immune modulators or plant defense elicitors or plant growth regulators and they might be helpful for the plant and plant roots they can absorb these uh, components however there is a constant cooperation between microbes too okay so many microbes they because again you know it's a very open environment and any microbe can come near this these roots so sometimes it may be pathogen sometimes it may be mutualist or like cooperative plant or symbiotic plant okay so depending on their uh, uh, functional characterization they might be helping in for sending quorum sensing signals they might be secreting bacteriocins which will not allow other ba bacteria to come near or they might be secreting antibiotics again for the same purpose many of these microbes may, might be present in a biofilm so there are constant co there is a constant cooperation going on within these different type of microbes within microbes plant to microbe and microbe to plant okay so at all level there is a constant cooperation going on and as i told you earlier that uh, even the abiotic factors you know like uh, determine or modulate the uh, soil and rhizospheric microbiome so it depends on which soil type we are using for any particular plant in a different soil type different type of microbes will flourish at different ph different type of microbes will flourish different nutrients like let's say if uh, a soil is uh, 
um, let's say iron rich or calcium rich, then different type of microbes will flourish in those environments. Even the external abiotic factors like CO2 level, precipitation, temperature, UV radiation, and specifically geographical factors, they all determine the microbial compositions. Like uh, if you say uh, basil, like holy tulsi, uh, sometimes it grow in one niche, but it doesn't grow in another niche. And it might be because of uh, uh, different geographical factors or different uh, uh, outs, uh, like environmental factors like temperature or precipitation and all these things. Okay, so <clears throat> if uh, we want to understand any question related to plant microbe interaction or microbe microbe interaction mm, residing near a plant, we have two approaches. One is traditional methods, as uh, Dr. Deepshika pointed out, that you know they try to use different uh, experimental biology methods and try to identify these plant microbe interactions. However, the second approach is using computation biology. So when we use computation biology, you know we try to extract the DNA and uh, try to identify based on those DNA or homology to that DNA that uh, which kind of uh, um, mi microbes are present there, which kind of uh, genes are present in that micro microbial community. And based on those, uh, based on those uh, leads or those answers, you know, we may do additional, like some other experimental work for confirmation. Okay. So, the major aspect of computational biology is that uh, uh, it is uh, it takes less amount a little less amount of time as compared to traditional methods and you get an overall idea about the community and then if you want to do some if you want to ask some specific questions then you can ask those specific questions after you know after getting the uh, after getting some specific leads okay so <clears throat> This is a very broad question, but uh, I am sure you have heard the word data. Okay, so most of uh, uh, most of us uh, who are computational biologists, they rely on data. Okay, like we need data so that we can work on the on that data and try to give some hypothesis. Okay, so and data can be of different types. Okay, so um, again, this is biology, but uh, you know we have DNA. We can like DNA is uh, DNA get transcribed into RNA okay? and RNA get translated into proteins. Okay. And then protein, as I told you, has a biological function. So we have different types of, uh, uh, we have different types of uh, material, which we can find the data for. Okay. And that's what I, I am talking about here. So if we have, if we are talking about DNA level that we can, you know, do the DNA sequencing and get the genome sequencing, uh, genome assembly and annotation. If we have RNA, you know, we can do transcriptomics or we can do the RNA sequencing and we can identify their transcriptome. If we have proteins, we can do proteomics like LCMS and different other methods to identify which proteins are being expressed. We can also identify, you know, like protein protein interactions using different strategies or we can uh, identify gene expression using microarray. Nowadays, we are doing RNA-seq. Okay, so there are different types of different or different levels of data which uh, mm, people work on as a computational biologist. As you can see here, like if you are more interested in ap uh, genome and epigenome, then you do these different strategies like DNA, DNA seq or w whole genome sequencing, whole epigenome sequencing. If you are working on transcriptome, which is at RNA level, then you can do RNA-seq or uh, long non-coding RNA sequencing. If you are, if you want to identify that, uh, which kind of secondary metabolites any, in which kind of secondary metabolites are present in any sample, then you can do LCMS, GCMS, or NMR strategies. Okay, and you can do, you can identify different type of proteins using proteome data. And the good point now is that. Uh, you can accumulate all these different type of data all together and do a system biology approach and find out uh, a lot of information, a lot of cumulative information using different strategies. So we can do functional annotation, gene ontology, we can identify different pathways, we can identify different networks. I hope you are able to hear me. Sorry. Hello. 
Yeah, you are able to hear me, right? We are able to hear you. We are able to hear you. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, it means there was some background noise earlier, but now it is stopped. So I thought that may be okay. Let me just go there again. <clears throat> okay, so based on all these different type of data, we can, you know, get a lot of biological information, and we can propose new theories or new suggestions regarding, you know, that particular system. But the most important aspect, you know, is quality. So each data at whatever stage you are uh, procuring the data, each kind of data comes with a quality score. So I'm sure like quantity matters, but we should never compromise with the quality. And it's very important for us to know what quality stands for or which kind of quality we are trying to use for that particular data. Okay. So when we try to do these kind of uh, analysis or genome characterization, we identify a lot of things, okay? So genome is uh, just a cumulation of ATGC nucleotides, right? So, but based, based on its length, based on its uh, uh, constitution, we can identify a lot of information from the genome. <laughs> So we can identify, first of all, which like the whole genome doesn't encode proteins or doesn't encode genes. So first of all, when we have a genome, we try to identify that uh, what are the genes being encoded from that particular genome. And then we try to identify their function based on computational strategies. OK, so based on those computational strategies, we try to you know, do their putative gene function identification, either based on previous functions, or sometimes we also try to mm, identify new functions using different type of domain analysis or motif analysis, which are present in those genes. We can identify different type of proteins which are involved in different type of physiological or metabolic pathways, means we can, we can construct the whole metagenomic pathways uh, metabolic pathways present in that particular organism. We can identify different secondary metabolites. We can identify different volatile compounds, okay, or branch chain amino acids or different type of proteins we can identify from the genome. What else we can do is we can compare two genomes or more than two genomes to understand that how their physiology or behavior or habitat are different as compared to each other. OK, we can identify their evolutionary perspective. We can identify that uh, how, let's say, what Dipshika Mem was talking about, that how E. coli and Salmonella, they were very close relatives earlier, but later on they diverged. So how that divergence came into, came into uh, existence, we can identify those kind of studies using genomics. We can identify pathogenicity islands so that we can find out that, OK, why that particular organism is uh, a pathogen. And we can do we can do different type of SNP analysis like short nucleotide polymorphisms and find out that uh, what are the differentiating factors between two organisms. Okay, so <clears throat> one another question I'm sure uh, I haven't discussed it, but uh, you will find out in my next slides, and that's why I'm telling you here that. In our computational biology, we discuss, we do a lot of work based on previous databases. Okay, so databases are like, uh, mm, like a, like an organized data, which has all the information which we know till now. Okay, so when we do the genome sequencing, that genome is a unique genome as compared to others. So we want to know that how it is related or how it is, uh, if we compare that genome with other organized databases or other organisms which are present uh, earlier, can we, can we find out the similar things between th those two organisms? So that's where these databases are required. So these databases are a structural collection of information. And, uh, you know, like they include each records and entries. And, uh, you know, like, uh, first of all, the most important thing is they are organized and they are Curated. Curated means uh, most of the databases are uh, quality proof. Okay, so a lot of uh, time and efforts has gone to confirm the quality of each and every data. Okay, so we have like you know after post genomic era, like uh, after 1990s or 95, in 1995, there have been a lot of data and. Uh, <clears throat> 
when we have a lot of data, we use, we organize that data to understand and to analyze and to organize. And we make created these kind of large macromolecule biological database. Okay. And if you have never, if you don't know about it, but uh, you want to know then NCBI, National Center for Bi Biotechnology Information in uh, Maryland, Bethesda in U USA, they have a very, you know, this is the largest biological database which is present, uh, you know, in, amongst research community. And it has information about uh, all diverse aspects of genomics. So they have information about nucleotides, they have information about protein, structure, and simultaneously, there are other databases too for these different types. But in NCBI, we have most of these information uh, present there. But simultaneously, there are other databases, other secondary databases too, which uh, which have organized the same information in a more precise and uh, organized manner. Okay, and depending on what function you are looking for you can use that particular data and try to compare your uh, your genome or your proteins okay <clears throat> so as i told you that omics is quite diverse okay and as i told you there is genomics there is transcriptomics and each each omics help in a different way okay so if it is genomics it helps us in comparing the dna protein of uh, uh, one organism or many organism Simultaneously, if we are using 16S amplicon meta taxonomy, it, it can profile the biodiversity of a microbial sample. If we have my, meta, if, like if we have metagenomics, then it can shine a light on function. If we have meta transcriptomics, it will tell us what is expressed under a specific condition in a microbial sample. If we have meta proteomics, it can quantify the relative abundance of different enzymes in any sample. So. All these different omics strategies can be used for a different purpose. Okay, so it depends on what your question is. So depending on your question, we can identify a particular strategy and see how it will work and what is the kind of experimental input we need for that particular omics and we can do the next step. Okay, so Mm -hmm. I hope I am on time right now. So it is 140. Yeah. So there are two important questions before computational biologists when they talk about microbial community profiling. Okay. So let's say a plant soil sample or plant rhizosphere sample. So the first question is who is there? Okay. So as I told you that there are there might be a lot of organisms present in that niche. So the first question is who is there? And the second is what are they doing? Okay, so who is there means we want to do taxonomic profiling. We want to identify that which organisms. And uh, uh, the second question, like what are they doing? It means what are their functional profiling? Like which kind of functions they are doing or they are involved in. So sometimes we, Again, it depends on our question that what is what we want to do, but sometimes we just want to know who is there and sometimes we want to know both of these answers that who is there and what are they doing. Okay, so these are the two major questions and <clears throat> now I will come into a little bit of the methodology or, or computational aspects. So till now, I think most of the aspects were theoretical and, uh, you know, more related to biology, but now I will start to uh, pointing out some aspects which are more computationally related and maybe experimentally related too. Okay, so the this is an overall methodology like what we follow if we want to know if we want to know who is there and what are they doing. Okay, like all those two aspects we use this strategy. Again, the first major point is that we need some kind of experimental to get the DNA because see uh, getting getting the dna is the first step in or getting the protein or getting the rna getting the input data is the first requisite for computational biology and uh, 